I'm not going to lie, um, reading through Revelation chapter 1 made me want to just stop the flow of John and just go back to Revelation. Um, it's a wonderful book. It's just, I don't know, for me, I think, I think it's the most beautiful book in the Bible. I mean, it's all beautiful, of course. But just the, the imagery and just the fact that you just consistently see Christ is conquered, and because of that, the church conquers as well. Um, it's just an amazing thing to see in Revelation. But just as well in our text this morning, it's an amazing thing to see as well as Christ conquers through his church, uh, as we'll see by uh, the giving of his spirit, of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, so I would invite you to turn with me this morning to John 15, beginning in verse 26. Our focus this morning, continuing in the flow of this farewell discourse, will be John 15, 26 to, uh, actually into chapter 16, verse 4. So 15, 26 to 16, 4. In light of the opposition, the hatred that we'll receive from the world, our Lord Jesus tells his church this morning, the word of the living God reads this morning. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. They will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Lord God, again, we thank you for this day. We can come together and worship you after a week of being out in the world and participating in secular activity. We can cease from those things. Even as we are seeking to perform those duties and those things in light of your word to the glory of your name, uh, working heartily as for you and not for man. We thank you for this time where we can come together and just wholly and purely set our thoughts upon you. Come together and worship you in spirit and truth. Set our hearts, affection, our minds, attention upon you as you have revealed yourself sufficiently and clearly in your word. Lord, as we go forward this morning and to the worship of the proclamation of your word, I pray that, that your word would do such a great work in the sheep here this morning, myself included. I pray that you would use your word this morning to call sheep that don't even know their sheep out of the sheepfold of the world to, to serve Christ, that they would hear his voice and that they would follow him. As we hear converted Christians, born again Christians are seeking to follow our good shepherd as well. May we hear the voice of our shepherd and may, may we be built up by his voice. May we be built up by his word. May we be filled with knowledge. That we would be filled with a greater desire to serve him. Would you grant me the grace to speak your word with clarity, Lord God, as we are purely here for you, which is why we read your word, which is why I'm purely here to seek to as an under-shepherd that, that you have placed here to seek to explain your word. May, your, may you do your great and powerful work through your word, Lord God, by your word and your spirit. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the flow of the teaching that we find ourselves in this morning, you would recall that the Lord Jesus has just brought, brought forward to his apostles and by implication us as well, um, that though he is soon to be going away, 
that does not mean that the world's hatred of him is going away along with him. He's about to go, but the world is still going to hate him and by implication hate everyone who follows him, hate his people because we align ourselves with him. We heard our Lord Jesus say last week, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, I chose you out of the world system that hates me, therefore because of that the world is going to hate you. A servant is not greater than his master beloved, so if they persecuted him, as we read from the Gospel of Matthew, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, if they have ultimately put him to death, Christ Jesus, how much more will they come against us and per persecute us who remind them of him, who remind them of the one whom they hate? Now, this is why, as we brought out last week, that alongside the words of our Lord, here at the end of John 15, the consistent testimony of Scripture is that the Christian life is one that includes certain opposition from the world, certain hatred from the world. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, does that look differently in different ways? Yes, we, we cover that. Different parts of the world, um, even, in, even in, from the aspect of those whom uh, we are dealing with, hatred shows itself in many different manifestations from a sinful heart. It could show itself in full rage. It could show itself in just total indifference, and I don't care what you have to say to me at all. I could care less about you whatsoever. That's still a manifestation of hatred and opposition and persecution to Christ and his church and the truth. 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You know, there's no might, there's no maybe, there's no if you really, really serve him, this might happen. All who are doing this, who desire to do it, will be persecuted persecuted. 1 Peter 2.21, for to this you have been called, speaking to the church, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. In his life here on earth, Jesus Christ completely manifested a God-centered view of life, seeking to do, as we discussed in the verse of the month, seeking to do the will of the Father and the will of the Father alone, a, a completely God-centered life. And at the same time, in doing that, he, as we quoted from John 7, 7 last week, testified to the world that its works were evil. By living purely under righteousness, uh, by implication, you are then testifying to the world by everything you do, everything you say, that its works are evil, that its opinions, that its suppositions, that its motives are all evil. They are all in contrast to God. And because of that, as the world got the opportunity they murdered him. They put him upon a cross, nailed him to the cross, and let him suffer until he died. They murdered the Lord of glory. And obviously, as we mentioned last week, and the hatred of the world being the fulfillment of Scripture, it was all under the sovereign ordination of God. Uh, the word that is written of them hating him without a cause... Right, as we heard at the conclusion of our text last week, they must hate me without a cause. That must be fulfilled. Right? It must be. They must murder him. They must put him upon the cross because if he does not go to the cross, then there is no salvation for the church. There is no salvation for God's people. But along with the fact that it was ordained by God that the Son would voluntarily lay his life down for the salvation of all his people, another aspect of this is that Jesus also did this as an example for us whom he laid his life down for. Right? So he did it for our salvation, for our reconciliation to God. Right? This word must be fulfilled, but also within that he's doing it as an example for us, as Peter says in 1 Peter 2. Because as we live our lives as followers of Christ, here today, so many years after Christ was put upon the cross, as we live our lives as, as his followers, Manifesting the fruits of desiring what he desires, as we've seen, as we, as we went through John 15, desiring what he desires, abiding in his love, experiencing the fullness of his joy, loving his church, being his friend, living a life of continual prayer towards the end, uh, that, that we glorify him in his name. In doing that, beloved, we show the world an image of the one whom they supremely hate. We show the world an image of Christ who testifies to them that their works are evil, that what they do 
is wrong, that there is no neutrality here, that what they're doing is evil, that it is wicked. And just as he endured his suffering to the glory of his Father and for the sake of his church, for the sake of his people, we are to do the same as well. We are to follow the example of our Lord, that truth is more important than my comfortability, that God is, is more worthy than my life. Amen. So that is the example that he has left us. The truth, love for God, love for neighbor, is worth living for regardless of what the world spews out against it, whether it's an insult, whether it's indifference, whether it's full rage against me and seeking to take my life or put me in jail and so forth and so forth. We could come up with many uh, instances of how this can be seen. And if we so be Christian this morning, truly Christian, that is the example that we are to follow. There is no other example to follow because there is no other Christianity. There is no other gospel. This is the gospel. This is Christ. This is the example he's given us. This is biblical Christianity. Anything else is a counterfeit. For it has been granted to us. If you be in Christ this morning, Philippians 1.29, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe but also suffer for his sake. It's been given to you as a gift. It's not of yourselves, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's a gift of God. You've been saved by grace through faith. And it has been granted to you that you should not only believe for the sake of Christ, but also suffer for his sake. And, and we who have been granted that gift know that he's worth, He's worthy of that. Amen? He is. <clears throat> Certainly, those immediately hearing these words, the the apostles who are, who are immediately hearing these words, in the context of this could be thinking, okay, well, really, now, how are we going to make it through this? Right? You, you, you told us about this opposition. You told us about the hatred of the world. You're going to be gone. We're going to be here just us. Uh, you, you've been with us for three years, guarding us, teaching us, keeping us from the influence of the world, because really they've been just supremely coming against you instead of us. How can we do this alone? You just got through telling Peter not too long ago that he was going to deny you three times. You know how weak I am. If Peter's going to do that, what could I do? What am I going to do without you being here with me physically, Jesus? How am I going to be able to do the works that you did and bear this fruit that you just got through speaking of amidst all this opposition and hatred without you actually being with me? How am, I going to, how am I going to do that? And here in our text for this morning, our great friend in Christ Jesus tells them exactly how they and how we are going to do this. Of course, he could have just told them of the hatred of the world and left it at that, because in many ways, he's already told them how they're going to do this. Right? We just got through in John 14. I'm going to the Father. You're going to do these words. Ask, it will be given to you. I'm sending you a helper. He's going to remind you of my words. In many ways, he's already told them. But to his friends, he further comforts them. And he further does that with the knowledge of how they will continue to function in truth and endure this opposition just as he has in the midst of the hatred of the world. He comforts his friends because we're not just slaves. Amen. We're slaves. We're his friends. So in contrast to modern secular psychological thought and even in contrast to what you might hear in a lot of pulpits, even in this country this morning, Jesus doesn't tell them, hey, this is going to happen. The world's going to hate you. You're going to be opposed. But you guys got this. You guys are strong. You guys are firm. You guys are immovable. You guys got this. Believe in yourself. You can conquer this. You can make it through this because of who you are. Believe in yourself. Put your mind to it. And you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. You guys just need to radiate to the world that confidence in yourself and they'll never be able to face it. I feel gross even saying that. No. Because Jesus knows that apart from him we can do nothing as he just got through telling them. John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches, you must be connected to me. Apart from me, you're not doing a thing. Apart from me, you can do no thing. Apart from doing all things and abiding in him, we are just like the church in Laodicea. We are wretched, pitiable, pitiable poor, blind, and naked. That's, that's what comes about when we trust in self. Lukewarm, not doing anything 
great for the kingdom of God at all, not doing anything worthy for the kingdom of God at all. So as Jesus is indeed going to the cross and back to his Father to see to it that his people will do these words, beloved, he points them back to the Helper who he just mentioned to them previously who would be given to them. Uh, the one whom he told them. And John 14, 16 was just like him, right? He was another helper, meaning just another just like him. I'm sending you another helper and the one who would be with them forever. He points them back to the Holy Spirit. In light of all this that will come against them uh, and us as well, with the hatred and the opposition of the world, he says in 15, 26, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father... The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about me. But when the Helper comes, He's going to do this. Again, there's no might or maybe there. He will bear witness about me. So when it comes to the opposition of the world towards the church, before Jesus even brings them into the equation, before He even brings His people into the equation of how they are going to do this, He states that the Spirit Himself is going to make sure that He's being witnessed for he will bear witness about me. Jesus says, the Spirit's going to get this done. You don't have, don't have to get this weight off your shoulder. The Spirit is going to get this done. When the Helper comes, He will bear witness. Now, while we do participate in this, which we will get to, it would be because we have a biblical anthropology here, meaning we have a biblical understanding of mankind and who we are, that we can rejoice here that God has not left us all up to us, because that would be a task far above our limitations as mere creatures. It would be a task far above our limitations, especially as imperfect uh, creatures as well. We are finite. We're limited. If Christ actually did just leave this work to come against the opposition and hatred of the world, if he did just leave this all up to us, uh, well, then some of the possible concerns that the apostles could have brought up might be somewhat valid. It might be, how, how am I going to do this? I know I'm weak. I know I can't do this on my own. They, they would be valid for sure. We are weak creatures. We are unable. When it comes to the witness of Christ amidst the world that supremely opposes him, beloved, we and whatever natural abilities we may have are not strong enough, are not good enough, and not able enough to do what only God can do. Or not. But beloved, since the spirit of truth is coming, and in our context has come, we can be perfectly confident that Christ will be witnessed of because the spirit is perfectly strong and good and able enough to do so. He can't be stopped. He's gone. This is not too high a, a, a task at all for the spirit of truth because as the third person of our triune God, he is equal in glory, equal in power and majesty with the Father and the Son. He is God. Our God is one being who has eternally existed and three co-equal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. So those who would be coming against Christ, those who would be coming against his church with opposition and hatred are those whom the Spirit has created as he is God and those whom the Spirit uh, upholds their life at the very moment that they are seeking to oppose his people. He could take their life like that because he upholds it. He's the one who created it. And I mentioned this when we were back in John 14, looking at the distinction between the, purely just the Father and the Son. But when I say persons, when I say that there's three persons, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and that the Spirit is a person, when I say that, I mean that they all individually show the qualities of personhood. Personhood is you show a will, intellect, and emotion. You have an intellect, you have a mind, you have the ability to perform what is in your mind, you have a will... And you have emotion. You have a, affection towards what comes in your mind as well. So they all display their own distinct intellect, will, and emotion. They are three distinct persons in and of themselves who all share the same infinite being of God. Okay, And, and when I say being, I mean they share the same essence of God or the same existence of God. Okay, And, and how... I would say this is, okay, like a rock has being, a rock has existence, but it doesn't have personhood. If you throw it against the wall, it's not going to say, ow, that hurt, because it doesn't have personhood, but it does have existence. They all share 
the same existence of God, the same being of God, but are three distinct persons who have their own distinct will, intellect, and emotion. Another way you could uh, bring this about, maybe a little more close to home, is understandably me and Uriah here this morning. Me and Uriah are individually different persons. I am the person of Trenton. He is the person of Uriah. But in contrast to the being of God, human beings are uh, finite. We are limited. We are contained. Meaning, I can't share his being, and he can't share my being. Our beings are limited. Our beings are contained. We are separately human beings, and we are separately the persons of Uriah and Trenton. Uh, our beings are limited. But, beloved, as God is infinite and God is unbounded, right? He, his existence, his being, fills up heaven and earth. It's omnipresent. It, it, he, his being cannot be limited or contained or boxed up whatsoever at all. Because of that, there is, there is nothing to go against the fact that these three persons all share the one being of God. There's no problem whatsoever with the being or the existence. You can even use the word nature of God being shared by three distinct persons. They all 100% possess the perfect being of God, while they are all 100% distinct persons who individually relate to one another and their creations according to their own distinct intellect, will, and emotion. Are we tracking together on that? Yeah? If not, that's, that's a conversation for, for fellowship. And I want to I make that clear about the Holy Spirit. I kind of went through some of that back when we were John 14 talking about the Father and the Son. But I, I want to make that clear concerning the Holy Spirit because in most cults who pervert uh, the person of Christ, they also pervert the person of the Spirit as well. If you pervert God, you pervert Christ, it's, uh, it seems like it's just subsequently going along with that you're going to pervert the Spirit as well. They try to say that the Spirit is just some force or something like that. Right? It's just something that comes out of God. It's not an actual person. He's not actually God in and of himself. He's just kind of a force that comes out of God uh, by which God does things. Well, we've already seen that he has his own intellect and even will in the fact that John 14, 26, Jesus told his disciples that when he comes, he will do what? He will teach them all things. And bring to their remembrance all that he has said to them. Right? So he has the teaching of Christ, the words of Christ in his mind, in his intellect, and he's going to teach it. He has an intellect and a will to bring about what is in his intellect, what is in his mind. You have, you have the mind and the will to bring what is in the mind out in order to do that, in order to teach. Just as well in the verse that we are in. He will bear witness. He will bear witness about Christ, which is showing intellect and will. He knows Christ in his mind and he bears witness about Christ. He has the knowledge of Christ and the ability to act upon it. We've also seen in John 3, 8, that just as the wind blows where it wishes, you can also translate that, just as the wind blows where it wills, so does the Spirit of God on everyone who is born of him. He goes upon and births everyone who he wills. Whom he chooses to do so. I can't harness the wind, make it do what I want it to do. You can't harness the Spirit of God, make him do what you want him to do either. The Spirit blows upon everyone whom he wills. You see that truth again in the fact that Paul tells us that within those who are born, within the church, we who have been baptized into Christ Jesus by the Spirit of God, in 1 Corinthians 12 11, that the Spirit gives gifts to those in Christ individually as he wills. We've all been gifted by the Spirit of God as the Spirit has chosen by his, by his intellect and His will to do so. He's not just some force that goes where He's forced to go, beloved. He wills and He makes choices as a distinct person of the Godhead. And of course, He has emotion as we are commanded not to grieve Him, Ephesians 4.30. He, he has eternally, as God, He has eternally hated sin. When we sin, we grieve the Spirit. He's We've been commanded not to grieve him. And as we'll see next week, uh, since he has come to also convict the world of sin and righteousness, well, it must be because he has a problem with sin and a problem with unrighteousness. And that, that's showing emotion. That's showing affection towards something. So, again, he is no force. He is a distinct person of the eternal Godhead. 
100% God in his being, which is why Jesus calls him another helper, which we looked at back when we were in John 14. That is the Greek word that means another of the same kind, not just another of something different. He is another helper because he is another just like him. So, and seeing that, from what our Lord says here in chapter 15, verse 26, and the verse we're in right now, the fact that we read that the Spirit is sent by the Son and proceeds from the Father does not mean that He is any less than any of them at all. The fact that He's sent by the Son, proceeding from the Father, doesn't mean He's less than or um, of less worth or anything like that. Uh, if you think about it, we've actually heard the same truth about Christ as well. We've heard the exact same, almost the same terminology concerning the person of the Son as well, just in a little different way. And we wouldn't come to the conclusion that he is less than. Amen? You know, we, we wouldn't do that. Jesus as well comes from the Father. He comes from the Father. He is sent by the Father. And he is still no less 100% God. Though he is sent. And he doesn't come to do his own will, but he comes to do the will of him who sent him. So, these terms of scripture do not convey to us levels of worth or anything like that. But they simply present to us the continued understanding that there is a clear distinction in the persons of the Godhead and that there is a certain manner in which they conduct themselves in their relationship to one another. Okay, And that's why we use, which you wouldn't find this terminology in Scripture, it's just terminology that brings about a theological truth. Uh, that's why we call the Father the first person of the Godhead. And the Son is the second person of the Godhead. And the Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. Because Scripture, beloved, never presents that the Father is sent. It never presents that the Father proceeds from anything. But then we come to the Son. The Son is said to be sent by the Father. He's never said to be sent by the Spirit. Though the Spirit is said to be sent by the Father and the Son and to proceed from the Father. Thus, first person, second person, third person. This is uh, why the historic creeds, uh, Athanasian, for example, would confess that the Son is eternally begotten by the Father and that the Spirit eternally proceeds from both. So the, the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. It's their, their filial relationship. And the Spirit eternally proceeds from both. And you could go deeper than that as to, to how this comes about. I, I actually uh, enjoy what Jonathan Edwards had, had to say about this. How this could be... How can an eternal person be eternally begotten and eternally proceed from the Father or, or, or from, from God. Uh, what he would say, and I think you can derive this from, from Scripture. Uh, I don't think it's just some philosophical argument. But what he would say is that God has perfectly known himself from all eternity. He has eternally, perfectly known himself. And that knowledge is so full, is so complete that it stands forth as a separate person who is the eternal Son of God. Stands forth as a separate person who is 100% God in his being, who is the Son. He is a reflection of the fullness of God's knowledge, the complete knowledge of himself. You can see that in the fact that Paul says that Christ is the wisdom of God, that he is, John 1, 1, the logos of God, the, the word of God, the complete understanding of God. And as there is such a, a love relationship between Father and Son, that love between Father and Son, that love betwe between God and the Father and the eternal knowledge that he has of himself that stands forth as a separate person is so full and is so complete at the same time that that love stands forth as a separate person uh, himself who is the Spirit of God. Which is why Romans 5, the love of God is poured into our hearts uh, to the glory of God by the Spirit. Right? We can even see that somewhat in the reflection of how we are made in God's image because we glorify him by knowing him and loving him. Amen? By knowing him loving what we know about him, glorifying him, as the catechism question says, and enjoying him uh, forever. But nevertheless, nevertheless, these terms definitely are ways that God reveals to us the manner in which the distinct persons of the Godhead relate to one another. Uh, they have nothing to do with their worth or that one is lesser than one another at all, beloved. They are all equal in eternal glory. So, when we see that the Spirit is proceeding from the Father and being sent by the Son, in that truth, because of who the Spirit is, in that truth, we can be confident that just as the Son, who was sent by the Father, that the Spirit is not coming to do His own will, but He's coming to do the will of Him who sent Him. Amen? 
not coming to do his own thing. He's coming to continue the plans of the triune God. Just as the Son and the Father are one in their plans, so is the Spirit. He's God. Uh, every decision he chooses to make is in 100% agreement with the Godhead, and no decision of his can be frustrated by mere creatures whatsoever. Uh, the Spirit cannot be frustrated in his work at all. So when Christ says that he will bear witness about him, beloved, he will bear witness about him. He's God. You're not going to frustrate God's plans. You're not going to frustrate what God is going to do. God's never been on plan B. When he says he will bear witness, he will bear witness. The Spirit doesn't come from the Son and the Father to fail in anything that he is sent to do. Now, the opposition of the world against Christ and his people will not drown out the gospel and it will not smother his truth out of existence. Because to do so would mean that the Spirit could be drowned out out of existence. And beloved, if the Spirit can be drowned out out of existence, then so can the Father and so can the Son. Because they're all 100% God and their plans are one. But that's not happening, praise God. The triune God will conquer and he will see to it that his truth is born in this world. And as we go into what Christ continues to express in verse 27... We see the fact that the Spirit is not just out witnessing of Christ by himself, apart from the church. He's not, he's not out here doing this in exclusion of the people of God. But our friend in, in Jesus is, of course, bringing up our helper to encourage us of how his people will surely endure the opposition of the world by his power. As one of the reasons the Spirit of truth has come is to testify of Christ to the world, he does so through the very people that Christ came to save. Christ redeemed these people, the Spirit comes uh, to these people so that Christ, so that they would bear witness of Christ in their life. The very same people who Christ has already told us last chapter, who the Helper would be reminding of His very words for the purpose of their joy, peace, and strength and faith. So as Christ Himself has appointed His people for fruit that remains, beloved, another one of the reasons that we can be certain that this will be in our lives is the ever-presence of the eternal spirit of truth seen to it that this will be in our lives regardless of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. He has come for the purpose that Christ be witness of in the world, and he does this through those whom he himself has been sent to help, has been sent to advocate for in the midst of this fallen world. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So, just very practically, if I'm a Christian, how can I be confident in the midst of the opposition of the world that my weak self will continue to witness of Christ in doing the works of Jesus and bearing fruit? How can I be confident that that's going to happen? Not, not, not just positing how can they can be confident, how can I be confident as one of those who believe through their word. I can be confident of this because the all-powerful Holy Spirit of truth has come to bear witness of Christ. And if I truly be in Christ this morning, he has come to do it through me and all of my brothers and sisters. That's how I can be confident. That I myself, though weak and feeble as I, will bear witness in the midst of whatever the world has to throw at me. Because the Spirit of truth is going to see to it that it's done. He will come, and because of that, Jesus says, and you also will bear witness. Again, there's no might, there's no maybe there. You will. And it is that same truth that we see elsewhere in Scripture, beloved, that it is the Spirit who does this through his people. The Lord Jesus tells the very same apostles that he's speaking to here in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses... In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Certainly there's going to be people in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth who hate God and his Christ. Right? Certainly they're going to they're gonna experience that and find that. How are these weak men, how are we of the same stature in Myrtle Springs this morning to advance the kingdom of God? How are we to do that? How are we to bear fruit and witness for Christ against a seemingly rather large army of the world? Well, beloved, it is the Holy Spirit who empowered them to do so. 
And it is the Holy Spirit who empowers us to do that very same thing as well, who continues to empower his people to do that very same thing as well. In fact, a few, a few verses before, before that in Acts, Jesus actually ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem until the promise of his Father came. Until the Holy Spirit came, don't go. Luke records something similar for us towards the end of his gospel. In Luke 24, verse 45 to 49, the word of the living God reads that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Something of the same there. We're to proclaim. We're to proclaim his gospel to all nations. He says, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But then he says, in concluding that, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You're going to do this, but don't you go until you're clothed with power from on high. Because apart from being clothed with power from on high, Apart from being empowered by the Holy Spirit, we cannot accurately witness for Christ the way we ought to. Apart from the Spirit of God, we will not witness for Christ in word, in deed, the way that we ought to as his people. We must have God working in us that which is pleasing in his sight to properly do what he would have us do. I can't do it apart from his grace working within me and me working that out. We must have the Spirit of God. We must be clothed with power from on high, not from this earth, but from on high or we will fail. And while they were in somewhat of a transitionary time then when the fullness of God's covenant had come in Christ, in contrast to them who were to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, beloved, we're not waiting any longer. We're not waiting any longer for the promise to come. The promise has come. If you are in Christ today, then the clear teaching of Scripture would present that you do have the Spirit. The Spirit is not some kind of second thing that gets attached to you after salvation. If you're in Christ, you have His Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, then you're not in Christ. You're not a saved person. Romans 8, verse 9 to 10. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. You cannot belong to Christ if you do not have His Spirit. Paul says, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So, anyone who is truly connected to Christ by faith has the Spirit. To say the opposite would be an unbiblical thought that is not contrived. From the clear teaching of scripture. One of the evidences that one has a spirit beloved. Is not what you may see in some professed churches this morning. It's not rolling around on the ground. It's not acting in an ecstatic way. Or speaking a gibberish type of unknown language. That people claim to be tongues. But it's not biblical tongues. One of the evidences. And I would say really the main evidence. You could, you could look at specific ways of how this is to be seen. But the main evidence, is, evidence that someone has the Spirit of God is that they bear witness to Christ in their life. They bear witness to Christ Jesus in their life. That's, what, that's the main evidence that someone has the Spirit of God. They bear witness to Christ. That's what he has come to do. But while we can separate certain things and look upon individual aspects of the Spirit's work in the life of believers, you can sum it up simply to that. The Spirit works in believers' lives for the purpose that they bear witness to Christ. And that they do so in the midst of anything. In the midst of anything. Understandably, in our contemporary context, you have many professing Christians or professing churches today that profess to be partakers of the Holy Spirit. But when you hear them talk, they talk more about the Spirit than they actually talk about Christ. And that's a problem. Because the Spirit didn't come to bear witness about Himself. He came to bear witness about Christ. You ask them about their church or their Christian walk and there's barely any uh, or at all Christ in their speech. You should come to our church. We're spirit filled. You should come here. Uh, that person, man, the spirit is really moving in that person. Well, are they witnessing for Christ? Do they bear witness of Christ Jesus in their life? Because if I come to your church and you're just about a lot of things other than the gospel of Jesus Christ and how we are to serve him in the truth of his gospel, the spirit is nowhere near you. The Spirit is nowhere near you at all. The Spirit didn't come to do that. The Spirit came to bear witness of Christ. The Spirit doesn't come to bear witness of Himself. He comes to bear witness to Christ in the words and actions of His people. It's all of Christ 
in our life as his followers, empowered by the Spirit of God to do so. So, in Ephesians 5.18, we're commanded as Christians to be filled with the Spirit. That's a commandment. It's synonymous to being controlled by the Spirit. Right? We're commanded not to be drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but to be filled with the Spirit. You don't, don't be commanded by or controlled by worldly things. Be controlled by the Spirit of God. Be controlled by righteousness. So we're all indwelt, yes, by the Spirit upon conversion. But as we are being sanctified and conformed more into the image of Christ, we're commanded not to grieve the Spirit, but to be controlled by the Spirit. To be filled by the Spirit. To be dependent upon Him at all times. And what does that look like? What does it look like when someone is Spirit-filled, when they're filled by the Spirit? Well, Paul doesn't leave that up for opinion. In the subsequent verses, Paul tells us that it looks like the people of God addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with their hearts. It looks like giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It looks like submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what it looks like to be Spirit-filled. And that's where Paul then goes on to speak of wives submitting to their husbands as the church does to Christ. Husbands leading and laying down themselves for their wives as Christ did for the church. Fathers seeing to it that their children are raised up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Children obeying and submitting to their parents. And servants obeying their masters and masters treating their servants rightly in light of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In a group of people, in a church who are filled with the Spirit, we're talking about truly Spirit-filled, the biblical definition. What you have is a group of people who are witnessing for Christ in every aspect of their life. Whether they're together, or whether they're apart in their families, or whether they're at their occupation. Wherever they're at, they're witnessing for Christ. It's a Spirit-filled people, beloved. Whether they be gathered with the church, whether they be at their homes, they, they witness for Christ in word and deed. To be filled with the Spirit actually looks a lot different than what a lot of people think that means today. To be filled with the Spirit looks like Christ. That's what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. It looks like Christ in your life. And you know, it is interesting that Paul actually brings these same things up in his letter to Colossians. But there, he doesn't command them to be filled with the Spirit. He speaks of the same thing, addressing one another with melody in your heart, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives submitting to their husbands, husbands loving their wives, children uh, submitting to their parents, fathers disciplining their children in the instruction of the Lord, masters, servant, servant, master relationship. He addresses the very same thing, but he doesn't base it, as he does here in Ephesians, as being filled with the Spirit. He actually bases it on letting the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Because the evidence that one is filled with the Spirit is the same evidence that you're letting the words of Christ dwell in you richly. They're not two separate things, beloved. As I'm filling myself with the words of Christ, as I'm storing up His words in my heart that I might not sin against God, the Spirit of God is using that and filling me with that truth, with the desire to continue to serve in righteousness, to do what Christ would have me do. As his disciple. If you're filled and controlled by the Spirit of God. It's because you have the words of Christ. Dwelling in you richly. That the Spirit is working in your heart and mind. And you would witness for Christ in your life. Because doing these things from the heart. These evidences of being filled with the Spirit. Doing these things from the heart. Is obviously not just normal life. According to the opinion of mankind. Right? And we can look out and see that obviously. Let's just answer to ourselves. How many people today hate singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? Hate making melody to the Lord in their heart? How many hate giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ? A lot of people are okay with talking about God today, but how many want to talk about Christ? Actually giving thanks to Christ. How many hate submission? How many people in the world today hate the family? How many hate godly motherhood and fatherhood as defined by God and His Word? How many hate for children to actually be under the authority of their parents and want immature children to make their own life decisions? How many hate for many children to even see the light of day? So how are we going to continue to witness to the reality of Christ and His truth against this opposition and, and certain hatred of the world? 
And we're going to do it with full confidence and trust that as we store up God's word in our heart and that the words of Christ dwell in us richly, beloved, that the spirit of God is in filling us and, and clothing us with power from on high, that we would do this not by our strength, but by his certain strength to certainly see to it that it's being done. It, it is by the power of the spirit and him alone. So while we are certainly in a time where we don't have to wait for the promise of the father as they did who initially heard these words. We nevertheless do need to make sure, as those who are now indwelt by him, that we are obeying the command to be controlled by him, to be filled by him. Because apart from being filled by him, we're being controlled by our own opinions or the opinions of the world. Thus, apart from being controlled by the Spirit, we're actually putting on display in our lives a perverted view of Christ. Which then you should be surprised uh, that the world hates you. Because you're not showing them the one that they hate such is the case, then we need to repent. We need to repent. He, he, is, he is gracious to forgive, beloved. Confess our sin, faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If such is the case, then we need to repent of grieving the Spirit by warring against His ministry of witnessing to Christ. Warring against His ministry of witnessing for our Lord. We need to repent that the words of Christ dwell in us richly and accurately witness of our Lord by the power that only the Spirit of truth has to perform within us. And as he is all-powerful, and as he cannot be stopped, beloved, while we will grieve him, and while we will, as we're being conformed more into the image of Christ, while we will fall short at times, we can be confident, as he is God, that he will see to it that all of the elect of God, that all that the Father has given to the Son, will most certainly witness and endure. Will most certainly endure. He will keep us to the end, beloved. And going forward in our text, our Lord further states in the first four verses of chapter 16. He says, look, I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. And who will be the one who is bringing these things to their remembrance, beloved? The helper. The spirit of truth. The one whom our Lord Christ has sent to them for the very purpose that he would witness through them, remind them of his words, and keep them, beloved. Jesus said that he has said these things immediately to his disciples that they would not fall away. To keep them from falling away. Therefore, they will not fall away. And the Spirit will see to it that these things that Christ has said will be upon the minds of his own towards that very end, that they will not fall away. Certainly in their immediate context, they were put out of the synagogues. They were killed. And the ones who did it did think that they were doing service to God. And it is because they were servicing the quote-unquote God they had contrived in their mind and not the God of Scripture. As Jesus says, if you hate me, you hate the Father. You don't serve God if you don't serve me. The God they served was not the God of creation. Who has revealed himself in Christ. In our context today we deal with the same. Because according to the world and certain contemporary churches even today. If, if we here knew the true way of Christ. Uh, we would not be judging the evil in our world and our witness. And we would just love them. Right? We wouldn't be so judgy. We would just love. Well we are loving them. Amen. How do we know we're loving? When we love God and keep his commandments. When we obey his words. We're not dealing with just some opinion of what love is out here in the sky that somebody has formulated and everybody sounds good. We're talking about what love is as defined by God, by our creator, an objective standard of love that never changes because God never changes. We are loving them. We are, and we will continue to love them by the ever-present helper who our great God and Savior has sent to us and who proceeds from the Father. We who are in Christ will never fall away. Not only because Christ our Lord, who has received us from the Father, will never cast us out. But because the Spirit will see to it that Christ's words that he has spoken to keep us from falling away are brought to bear upon our hearts and minds as we continue to store up his words in our hearts. That the Spirit will mightily use them that we may more effectually witness for Christ in the world against anything. And Paul's second letter that we have to the church in Corinth, I'm concluding with this. He gives them some testimony of the things that he has went through. 
2 Corinthians 11, verse 24 to 28, he says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Thirty-nine lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. I was on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches." Beloved, how does one go through all that and continue to witness for Christ? How does one go through all that and not say, look, man, this is just, this is enough. And then the world encourage them, you know, you should get out of that. It's just too hard. You don't need to be in something too hard. All that danger you're going through, think of your life. How's he doing that? The helper. The ever-present Holy Spirit. Continually empowering him to witness for Christ in the midst of anything even in the midst of false brothers. The helper who is bearing witness of Christ to the world through him and continually bringing upon his mind his effectual words. And if you're in Christ, you have this helper this morning as well. If you're in Christ this morning, you have this helper. You can make it through anything and continually, uh, effectually witness for Christ in your life, in, through your words, through your deeds, how you relate to every aspect of your life because you have the helper with you. Because you're not alone. He is with you until the end of the age. Though we may not go through all the physical duress that the apostles and many in the church history have, I can assure you in knowing who the Holy Spirit, if, if we truly be in Christ, we would make it through everything that Paul went through as well. But nevertheless, there is much to make it through now in our current context as well. Is there not? There's much to come against. There's much to to oppose in the world today. In the midst of the very same world that we live in today, who very much still hates our triune God and His truth, very much still hates Christ and His truth, there is much to fight against and bear witness of Christ against. And where we be weak, may we be content knowing that God will not fail to work in us that which is pleasing in His sight. The Spirit will bear witness. He will. Beloved, and if we be in Christ, we will too. Trust in Him, lean upon Him, be controlled by Him, and live your life to the glory of God knowing that He's going to get it done. Keep your hand on the plow knowing that He's going to get it done. He's going to keep you until the end. Don't you dare let the fact that He's going to get it done move you to be slack in your witness. Don't be slack. Well, He's going to get it done so I can sit on the couch. No. Don't, 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 don't let that, that truth of his sufficiency move you to be slack. Why? Because he's sufficient to do it through you. He's ordained to do it through you. He's not doing it out here on, the, on, on his own. He's doing it through the people that Christ Jesus died for and through the people whom the Father gave Christ Jesus to do so. If you so be his, he is ordained to get it done through you. And he who began a good work in you will most definitely complete it. And that good work should be seen in the Spirit's work of conforming us more and more and more into Christ, bearing witness to our great God and Savior in every aspect of our lives. And beloved, may He use the proclamation of His Word this morning as a means to that end. Amen? Now as we come to the partaking of the Lord's Supper, we come to a part of our worship where we greatly see what secured and purchased that very fact that our triune God will complete and accomplish his plans of salvation from beginning to end for his church. Our confession states, and I quote, The supper of the Lord Jesus was instituted by him the same night he was betrayed. It is to be observed in his churches to the end of the age as a perpetual remembrance and display of the sacrifice of himself and his death. It is given for the confirmation of the faith of believers and all the benefits of Christ's death their spiritual nourishment and growth in Him, and their further engagement in and to all the duties they owe Him. The supper is to be a bond and pledge of their communion with Christ and each other. 
the bread and the fruit of the vine, the cup here before us this morning, symbolize for us the body that was broken and the blood that was shed on behalf of all of God's people uh, as Christ purchased his people for God, for the Father, out of every tribe, language, and nation. Purchasing, as we'll hear in a few moments as we read the words of our Lord, purchasing the new covenant, the eternal covenant on their behalf. These elements are a means of grace that God has given the church for the entirety of our existence to encourage us, to compel us to perseverance, and to keep our mind continually on his glorious gospel. Beloved, this is something that the Spirit uses to keep our mind on Christ, to witness to Christ, to one another this morning, and back to God who has done this for us in Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 26-29 the inspired word of God says through the Apostle Paul, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. We proclaim his death's sufficiency to save. We proclaim how it has brought us into right relationship with God. We proclaim how it has changed our relationship with his people. We proclaim how it has saved us. It is the basis for our salvation from beginning to end. It's the basis for the Spirit of God doing his work within us today. We do this until he comes. Paul continues to say, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup because anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself or discipline on himself if you so be in Christ this morning. And in examining ourselves as the apostle commands, we need to examine ourselves in light of this truth are we truly trusting in christ for our salvation are we truly following him as he has ordained for us to follow him are we truly bearing fruit of being connected to the true vine desiring what jesus desires being his friend growing in our knowledge of him living a life of, of continual prayer loving other branches loving his church we know that we've been brought out of death into life, 1 John 3, 14, because we love the brothers. Do I love his people? Do I love him? Do I love his truth? Do I abide in his word? Jesus says, if you abide in my word, John 8, 31, you are truly my disciples. Am I trusting in him and him alone and not just him and fill in the blank, myself? Do I see him as my only hope? Do I see him and his substitutionary death on the cross as the only satisfactory payment for the sin guilt that I've incurred on myself because of my sin against God? Am I trusting in him and him alone? Because this meal, beloved, has no significance whatsoever for one who is not trusting in him nor manifesting that trust in their life. This is a family meal. And we're not to partake of this supper in an unworthy manner. Now, obviously, as, as we say every time, the, the point of this uh, supper is not that you must be perfect to take it. You must be a sinner to partake of this supper. But the point of Christ's death, as we are proclaiming his death to one another this morning, the point of Christ's death is not, hey, I've died for you, therefore you can continue to live in sin and it's, and it's okay. No, he gave himself for us to redeem us out of all lawlessness, to purchase for himself a people who are zealous for good works. He doesn't give the people whom he died for the spirit so that they might witness for him, beloved. So that they will witness for him. Now, we might not all witness in the same measure. We might not all produce the same fruit, so to speak. But nevertheless, because we have been made a new creation in Christ and we now hate sin and love righteousness, we do bear witness. We do bear witness. We've been called out to bear witness for Christ. We have not been called out to bear witness of lawlessness. So anyone who is a part of the universal church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we practice close communion here. Not close where you have to be a member of this church, but you have to be a member of the one body of Christ. If you're a member of the universal church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You profess faith in our Lord and you have followed him in obedience to baptism as a believer. And you are in a good standing with a local church. And you're not under the discipline of another church. The elders of Brookside Baptist want to invite you to joyfully partake of this family meal with us. We want to invite you to joyfully share in this meal. And together remember and proclaim the greatness of Christ, our Lord, our great God and Savior. 
uh, to one another this morning. Before we partake, I do want to give a few moments uh, of silence to get our mind upon what the supper is about in remembrance of him and uh, some moments to be able to repent of any willful sin in our life if so need be. Repent this morning, I would encourage you to, and so partake of the supper out of worship to your great God and Savior who has granted you that repentance and who is faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness through your repentance. We'll use this time to get our mind upon Christ and then we will begin the supper. If you would